Hello everyone, if you are joining us live, we're finally here. Sorry, a little bit delayed, Robin and I, you know, it's that whole world of like, we're awesome at organic chemistry and understanding science and all that. And I said to her, I'm like a B or a B minus, um, depending on the day and on, on technology, but we're here. Um, and if you're catching us after the fact, if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, um, welcome. And just remember any of your questions that you have, put them in the comment section, whether we're live or watching later, you will be able to uh, get your questions answered um, by this incredible guest. This is an awesome topic. Um, so I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Ashley Koff. I'm a registered dietitian and CEO of the Better Nutrition Program. We are a company that creates better nutrition assessment tools to help practitioners and their patients connect uh, and really understand is your, is your current nutrition giving your body what it needs to run better. And um, one of those areas that it needs to run better is around brain health and telomeres. Um, so I put out the word because I always reach out to experts, um, people who have their own experiences, that's awesome. But the way that I define an expert is somebody who is up to date, reads, assesses and understands the science, but then also puts these into practical application, whether working with patients or, you know, advising the media and going through um, and talking about what you actually can do. So today, when I did my search, everyone was like, you've got to talk to Robin. So uh, Robin, welcome. <laughs> um, it is a pleasure to have you. And I thought before we launch into the lexicon of telomeres and help people understand everything, you know, that's going on in our, our brains and our systems, we would actually talk a little bit about you and your journey. So while I'm sharing this to some other pages, why don't you tell us how you became a dietitian and what, how you became interested in telomeres? Well, um, I became interested in nutrition initially because I was always really good at science and I always really loved it, but I didn't think that I would be a good fit working in like a lab somewhere. So I wanted something that would combine um, science with something that would allow me to interact with people and work directly with people. And as soon as I thought about, you know, going into nutrition and combining food and healing and wellness and science, I was totally hooked. Mm. And um, the journey kind of took me to a couple different places. I didn't become a registered dietitian right away. I did my undergraduate at NYU and then didn't do the dietetic internship straight away. I did about 10 years later. So instead, I went to work for the food industry and PR companies. And I did uh, branding and marketing and PR and like all this awesome stuff until I realized that I needed the credential. So I went back. And as I was doing my master's at Teachers College, Columbia University, I discovered a passion for integrative medicine and how nutrition fits into integrative and functional medicine. Um, and so that is the world that I work in now, which is really fun and rewarding. And it's this perfect combination of like cutting edge science and understanding biology and the function of how the body works and then applying that knowledge to getting to the root cause of why people don't feel well or have symptoms and then working with them to resolve those underlying causes so that the body basically just heals itself which is what we're going for. <laughs> That's amazing. And you know, you and I've never met and so we actually haven't had the opportunity to talk about our shared paths because I started off in I was a WPP girl, but I was at J. Walter Thompson and working in advertising, oh, awesome. strategy, you know, and all that <laughs> stuff. Um, and then went over to integrative medicine. So, um, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, overlap on this part. And because, yeah, shout because, out to Burson Marcel. I know. We're like, hey, <laughs> and I was at NYU, too. So, you know, I had it back in the early days. Um, so totally awesome on that piece. So. Um, so let's start off with at, at the beginning of any of these conversations, and especially with something like telomeres, which somebody is like, wait, what are we even talking about? Tell a what? I know, right? It's like the other day I was doing, <laughs> and actually later today, also doing another interview on um, on CBD, and I'm talking about this endocannabinoid system, and you're like, yes. come on, right? So what we want to understand, or I want to go through the lexicon so that we can be using the words, um, uh, you know, in the, in the same manner. So telomeres, telomerase, or telomerase, or however one wants to pronounce it, um, just to find some of the words that we're going to be talking about here would be great. Okay, so telomeres should be the first thing that we defined. And mm -hmm. it all, it most often gets compared to the little plastic caps on shoelaces, which is the perfect analogy. So if you think about your chromosomes, the each terminal end has this little 
shoelace cap called a telomere. And it basically prevents the chromosome from fraying. Mm. And it provides stability to the chromosome, which is what we need to kind of make sure that our genes are replicating properly and that we don't go down the the track of like, you know, developing cancer cells and cell proliferation and, and that kind of thing. So the telomere provides the structure to, um, the structure and the stability to our chromosomes. And every time that the, the cell replicates and DNA replicates, the telomere shortens by a little. Mm -hmm. But it's not a stagnant process because there is an enzyme called telomerase, which I think that's how you pronounce mm -hmm. it. I'm not 100% sure, but it's telomerase. That's how I'll pronounce it. I like it. Yep. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that protects the telomere from shortening too quickly. And it can also elongate the telomeres. So if you have good telomere telomerase activity, then you have healthier telomeres because they're not getting too short too fast. And um, in some cases, with really healthy habits, studies have shown that you can increase telomerase activity and therefore grow longer, but not too long, because that seems to be a problem too, mm -hmm. but grow appropriately long and strong uh, telomeres. So if I'm, I'm going to play it back. Um, so I'm going to see if uh, myself, like the listeners that are like, um, heard this properly yeah. but so what we we have and want to have are the telomeres and they're like the the cap on the shoelace or for those of us that have lost those caps when we've taken duct tape and done that to our shoelaces I used to do that a lot in my lacrosse shoes right <laughs> um, so we do that part and then telomere race as we've talked about enzymes actually helps the the make sure that we have the right length of those telomeres um, on that part now, you used another word that we've all heard about. We've all heard about chromosomes, but let's go through what a chromosome is and why it's important that it doesn't fray, as you were talking about. So the chromosomes house our DNA, and when DNA replicates, it's a, it's a careful process, and it's complicated and involved, but you know, it's one of those processes that go in our bodies that we don't really think about it until it goes wrong. So... <laughs> When a cell replicates, if anything goes wrong, it's supposed to push a self-destruct button, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, and then that creates a, a process called, called apoptosis, which is programmed cell, de cell death. So when DNA goes wrong, your body is supposed to just kill off that cell. Mm -hmm. um, and if it doesn't, that's sort of the very early mechanisms for how we can develop cancer. Mm. And so um, just through the normal activities of living, um, we like messes get created, you know, we, our bodies, you know, there's stress and there's other things. So as that occurs, would there be any signs that we're losing those end caps of the shoelace? Like, oh, my telomeres aren't doing better. Or is it something that we have to get tested to understand where in the health of our system, our telomeres are at, you know, if we have any faulty telomeres. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually it might be helpful to take a, a quick step back. Um, telomeres are, it can be regarded as a marker for biological age. So we mm -hmm. all know people who like seem really ageless and they're kind of, you're surprised about how old they are, mm -hmm. whatever, or they just don't age. And then there's other people who like, maybe they've had a tough life. Maybe they've gone through something really, um, traumatic and, you can almost see that the process or the problem has aged them somewhat. Mm. So this kind of gives us um, a potential mechanism for that kind of thing. So there's a genetic component of it. Some people are blessed with magic genes that help mm. them stay younger looking and resilient to, to um, disease and stuff. And then some people don't have that same kind of magical genome. So mm. there's the genetic components, which we don't, science just doesn't really know that much about. Um, yet. And then there's the telomerase activity. So because every time your cells replicate, the, telomere, the telomeres get a little bit shorter, that's why they can be measured and used as sort of uh, maybe a marker of biological age. Mm. Um, and I say maybe because there's testing that exists and there's testing that exists that's available to consumers and stuff. But there's some controversy about how reliable those mm -hmm. study those test results are. So um, I definitely know some practitioners who use it just to kind of get a snapshot for mm -hmm. the people who are really into wellness and they want to make sure that they're doing everything they can to um, age gracefully 
successfully and remain healthy. Um, and they use those tests and you can compare them every few years to make sure that you're trending in the right direction. Mm -hmm. If you're not sort of young for your age, however, um, the score may be, uh, what was the question again? It's totally good. Cause we were going down. I was saying like, is there a way that you, that you're like, you know, so for example, if my, if my, um, nail breaks, I'm aware that my nail breaks. And so oh, I'm not yeah. seeing inside if my telomeres have frayed. So what we're saying is it, it, what I'm hearing from you is there may be some clinical ways to assess the health of your telomeres, but probably the better path is to, and now I'm leading the witness is the better path um, to uh, assume that there are that we want to work on nourishing our telomeres um, a, as a as a part of better nutrition overall, you know, for better health. Is that is that kind yeah, of where we're leading? I, I yeah. mean, as far as like knowing how good a job your telomeres are doing, or if they're hanging in uh, well, I mean, there's definitely some. I would think some indications, but at this point, according to the research, it's really all about association. So, mm -hmm. like shorter telomeres. Um, they are being, uh, in some circles, in some scientific circles, they're being thought of as being maybe predictive. So mm. if you look at somebody and they have shorter for their age telomeres, then it may actually mean that there's an increased risk for certain chronic diseases like heart disease and cancer and, you know, neurological conditions and things like that. So there's definitely an association between chronic disease states and shorter telomeres. And there does seem to be an association between longer telomeres and lower um, instances and risk for those kinds of diseases. And so uh, okay. that would kind of underscore the, um, the desire for some people to want to test their telomeres. Um, and it's just a question of whether or not the tests that we have available as consumers and as practitioners are as rigorous as they ought to be. And I don't really know the answer to that. Yeah. And, you know, and so I think what you're saying is there might be signs. So um, we mentioned cancer. We mentioned just general aging. What about, um, is there any research associated with if somebody has an autoimmune disease that they're telling me that that's associated with telomeres where either, you know, if the body's attacking itself, we've talked about obviously with DNA replication or, or mm -hmm. differently where you were talking about uh, cellular apoptosis, right? The programming of the cellular death. Is that actually occurring? It, it, does it mean that we, if, if, we're, if we're working with somebody with an autoimmune disease, we may want to focus again on this telomere nutrition? Ooh, that's such a good question. You know, I didn't see anything in the research that I read that specifically stated anything about autoimmune directly. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that oxidative stress and inflammation reduce telomerase activity and mm -hmm. therefore is a tax on the health of your telomeres. So um, indirectly, I'd say yes, because mm -hmm. anything that promotes an oxidative stress state and anybody who is experiencing a lot of inflammation from any kind of cause, then yeah, your telomeres and your telomerase activity is definitely affected. Awesome. Okay, so if you're just joining us, um, thank you for popping in. And or if you're you've been watching the YouTube video and you're just like, okay, I need to come back to the beginning again. I'm here with Robin. We are talking about telomeres. She is explaining about the fact that telomeres are like the end caps on the, uh, the end of your shoe your shoestrings to keep them from fraying. And in that instance, it's to keep the chromosomes from fraying. I'm hoping that I do you proud here, Robin. Right? Yep. And um, and part of what monitors that is this activity of the telomerase or telomerase, however you're going to pronounce it. And that well, there are some clinical tests that a practitioner may do, um, and especially for tracking purposes, but we don't have all the, the ways to easily do it. So it, it's going to be harder on that part. But for certain people, whether you're being treated for an, um, you know, in excess of inflammation, that means diabetes, heart disease, some of these that we know, cancer risk. Uh, we were talking about speculatively, maybe um, autoimmune disease, especially the ones where we know there's an underlying inflammatory component. We want to take care of our telomeres. So that brings me to the next segment of this part, which is how do we do that? What is this information about feeding our telomeres or do we have to feed the DNA and that helps our telomeres? What do we do on that part? 
This is the part that I, I, there's so many parts of this that are so cool. Okay. Um, and so the, there's the food part, which is of course interesting to us as dietitians. Mm -hmm. And then there's the non-food part that I think is probably even more exciting in some ways. But you know, the bottom line is this, bad habits are bad for telomeres and good habits are good for telomeres. And so like the bad habits are things like smoking, having a poor diet, being exposed to a lot of environmental toxins like air pollutions. Mm -hmm. Hello, New York City. Uh, what are we going to do? Um, and high stress. Mm -hmm. These are all things. And it doesn't matter if it's an emotional stress or a physical stress. It's interpreted by the body in the same way. Mm -hmm. And so these kinds of conditions and um, sort of influences are bad for telomeres. And on the other side of the coin is that good habits are supportive to telomere health. So mm. eating a healthful diet, managing inflammation, meditation and stress release, exercise is a huge component of this. But the studies, actually there was this really great study, um, Dean Ornish and Elizabeth Blackburn, though they, they did these really uh, incredible pilot studies and they even teased out that it's not just physical activity, but it's exercise that you actually enjoy and physical mm -hmm. activity that you enjoy is actually more helpful for telomere length than say like physical activity that has to do with your job or mm -hmm. um, something, I guess that you don't enjoy presumably. So you just got, you know, a, you just got a couple of thumbs up and hearts oh, for good, that. Yeah. And I feel like one of the, like, for me, when, in, when we're talking about exercise outside of like, just so exercise isn't something I choose to do for my physical and mental well being as opposed to daily activity. But I think one of the key things in, that you're also picking up on there um, or hinting at is um, there are some exercises that I can do that actually don't demand that I turn my brain off that, you know, but if I'm like in a hit workout class, which I actually do enjoy, even though like the whole time I'm hating it, right? But if I do <laughs> enjoy it, I actually can't be thinking about the laundry list of other things that I'm doing. So I wonder also if like, it's actually shutting down my multitasking, which is probably uh, another valuable point as you were talking about with stress. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if we think about like meditation in general, who's to say that exercise can't be your form of meditation. I certainly hear that from runners all the time. Mm -hmm. And there is a common form of meditation that's called like a walking meditation. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, they have those like stone gardens in mm -hmm. Asia and stuff. So, so yeah, I mean, and like when my dog looks up at me with like the big green eyes and is like, let's go, you know, and it's like, okay, like, I'm like, all right, it's a meditation for me. And it's something he enjoyed. Yeah. So that part and then, is like, think about the contrast of like, you know, I hate running. Um, and I used to do it all the time. And then I realized that I really hated it. And I <laughs> would rather much rather do something else. Yeah. Um, so I only enjoy running if there's a beautiful path. Mm -hmm. Um, but save for that, I just don't anymore. Yeah. I, ra I would much rather do like Pilates class or something else that I really enjoy or like yeah. yoga. That's its own kind of like slow down and mindfulness and meditation that feels better to me. So, you know, it, it's like, you can contrast like the people who really like hit the pavement and they kind of, you know, they run, maybe they don't really enjoy it so much. And then like, think about a kid who gets outside and starts running with like such joy. Mm -hmm. I think there was a, there was a friends episode. I don't know. <laughs> Perfect. And you're I like, it was Rachel and Phoebe yeah. running in the park and right. Rachel's running all like, you know, normal and yeah. Phoebe runs like, ah! yes, yes. And she's like, yeah, yeah. totally. We all, so we all like, should be a little more Phoebe. Yeah. Yeah. Phoebe kind of exercise. Yes, that I love seems it to be the key. Cause it, it's something that brings you joy. Yes. And you know, I think that the it's, you know, we as practitioners, I think most of us really do uh, acknowledge the observation that how we feel and our attitudes and our outlook on life and those kinds of things have a tremendous impact on how our body works and even the rate of healing yeah. and how resilient our bodies are. But we don't have that much data on like exactly what the mechanisms there are. So when you kind of stumble upon a link between something like meditation, and even there was this really amazing study on the practice of like loving kindness meditation, which mm -hmm. is its own kind of like Buddhist type meditation, like just practicing loving kindness and tapping into feelings of joy and these kinds of good feelings, having a positive outlook on life, this might represent one of the mechanisms. And I would venture to guess that there are probably many, Yeah. Um, but this might be one mechanism where we can kind of see the link between the biology and the, the spirituality, mindfulness, mind, body connection. So 
Yeah, I think that's. And I love it. So I want to I want to move into um, because as we're learning about something and it becomes trendy and then suddenly you see it in a supplement, right? Like so, literally like telomeres, like supplements. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit. So you you mentioned, and I think we could go on and on, and rightfully should. And I think that that what we're talking about here is so valuable for anyone listening who is as, as both as a practitioner as an individual to understand that a massive part of your telomeres and your telomere function has nothing to do with the food. So help people be happier and more connected in their lives. Let's just go there, right? But I want okay. I want to unpack like so. Then there's the things that are bad for us and. Um, I'm taking a pretty strong stance consistently when people, so there are things we just know are bad for us, like environmental pollutants, um, which we, as you said, we don't have that much control over, uh, and smoking, which we have a lot more control over, hopefully, yeah. you know, but then there's this whole other gray area where people will say poor nutrition and, you know, or, um, hey, you know, you, you if you eat better, uh, then said differently, if you make better choices, they're good for your telomeres and, you know, all this stuff that we were just talking about from an aging standpoint. So, what I want us to do in this space is help people understand um, if they are, you know, looking at an anti-inflammatory diet or if they're trying to um, get a better balance of nutrients or eat organic more often or at least eat less um, uh, chemistry lab processed and more kitchen yeah. processed, you know, all the things yeah. that we would talk about as good recommendations. Are there standouts nutritionally either um, as part of their food and beverage choices or as part of their supplement choices that will really that we we've seen have any specific impact on um, taking up, you know, on helping maintain that proper length of the, the telomeres by way of impacting telomerase or telomerase. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of it because a lot of it comes down to inflammation. Um, you know, it's sort of like it, it really all comes back down to an anti-inflammatory diet. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's the Mediterranean diet that can achieve that. You can have a paleo version of an anti-inflammatory diet. There, there's a lot of, you know, you don't want to get, I don't like it when um, we get kind of like weird definitions <laughs> of diets. So like, for right. instance, pa I feel like paleo hasn't gotten, um, as good of, uh, I don't, as good of a, uh, I don't know, it, its reputation is not as great as a Mediterranean type diet, but like you can do Mediterranean style paleo. Because well, they're like the same thing, like, thing. Like, like, you know what I mean? The like, the, thing. Like, like the Mediterranean people were living back way longer. They are our paleo. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah like, so it's yeah. like, you can do the paleo diet wrong. Right. For sure. Like if you're just eating straight up meat all the time and you're not eating your vegetables, then it's not going to be anti-inflammatory. It's not mm -hmm. going to be great. Um, so I kind of feel like the most important thing that you can do for your health, and I feel like I say this all day long to clients, to the media, to everyone, is that you have to eat your vegetables. You have to eat your vegetables. You have to eat a lot of them. Choose different kinds, different colors, because they have these antioxidants. And fruit, too, by the way. Mm -hmm. They have antioxidants that improve the way your immune system work. They balance inflammation in the body and basically help you live longer. And it's study after study. It's so consistent. So when mm. people say that you like, oh, one day we say tomatoes are good. One day they're bad. It's a nightshade, blah, blah, blah. It's like you're, you're missing the forest through the trees. Mm -hmm. It's like, just eat a lot of vegetables, eat some fruit. That advice has never changed. But you know, I um, think, um, and it, it totally agree. And we both practice integrative functional, you know, one of the things that really frustrates me a lot about our, our colleagues and the space and all that is the one thing research does show is that a tomato pretty consistently delivers. So there's great variety in tomatoes, but a tomato mm -hmm. delivers compounds altogether what the research does show is that lycopene isolated by itself usually doesn't work as well. So, right. which, you know, why I love you're saying like getting your fruits and vegetables is like the thing, those don't, I mean, there are some supplements. I love glucoraphanin, for example, you know, from broccoli, but I think there are very few supplements that actually of those antioxidants are going to do for you what your fruits and vegetable would do in a whole form. Do you agree? Yeah, I definitely do agree. You know, there, there's a couple of different things because there, you know, the antioxidants are, that's the plant power. Like mm -hmm. that's really where it's all coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and you can try to isolate it and you can try to like pulverize it and freeze dry it and whatever. But I don't know, is it the same? Is it not the same? 
eat the right kind of food. And then, you know, you can fill in the gaps as mm -hmm. necessary. Like it drives me banana. You know, a lot of this research will say like, you know, the, they'll call out some of the nutrients. So it's like antioxidants and fiber and healthy fats and mm -hmm. omega threes and, you know, carotenoids from all of the bright orange, dark leafy green vegetables. And, and, you know, that's why I say like, choose a lot of different. A rainbow, colors. right? A rainbow. Yep, the rainbow. Exactly. <laughs> it was good advice then. It's good. Yeah. Advice, it's yeah. good advice now. Um, <laughs> And then they also call attention to some of the methylation nutrients, which I thought was mm -hmm. cool too, because we're talking about genetics. That might be a little bit too intense for this particular topic, but there you go. No, I think it's um, great. So first of all, we have some of our, you know, diffum and like, hot, you know, um, like Amanda Archibald's on here, culinary genomics, you know, et cetera. So awesome. I think that, that looking at, so let's unpack that for a second, which is it may be that genetically uh, go through that in terms of what, what the methylation piece is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So methylation means the process by which, um, your genes get expressed. So you have a genetic code and say you have a genetic code for like some horrific disease. It does not mean that you're going to get said horrific disease. You only will get it if that gene is turned on. And there's many, many instances where those genes, I mean, we carry genes for all sorts of things, mm -hmm. but they're silenced by a specific process. So, um, Methylation is the process by which uh, helpful genes are turned on and not so helpful genes are suppressed. Mm -hmm. And the methylation nutrients include things like folate and B vitamins and, you know, methionine and some amino acids, um, betaine and uh, what else? Magnesium, zinc, a lot of selenium, like all of the important, like everything. Mm -hmm. all of um, and so we want to support our body's methylation process so that when we have cell replication, our, the good genes are activated and the not so good genes continue to be suppressed. And that ties in with telomerase because, and telomeres because we're still talking about genes and replication and genetic code. So there probably is a very big intersection there. I don't think anybody's quite worked out exactly how it works, but we're still talking about genes and genetics and how our nutrients impact the way that our genes are expressed. Yeah. Um, so there's and my that favorite, my favorite example of that, um, as you were just talking, the reason we kind of went down that path is getting your fruits and vegetables and your vegetables in particular, but some of you provide these versions like a folate that you'll find in green vegetables. But we as a country from not, since 1920s have been adding folic acid to all of these grain, you know, highly mm. fine grain products. And so the yeah. difference, you know, for people listening is, your folic acid is not your folate. Whether or not you need a methylfolate may be, uh, you know, as we were saying, specific to your genetics. I, I don't see that there's any harm in anyone choosing a methylated methylfolate unless nope. you have, the caveat would be unless you have a couple of the markers and then there are certain things you, you, you need to work on with your practitioner. But um, the but we do know that you need to be choosing folate over folic acid. Um, so I think yeah, that, that's correct. That's a way. Yeah, because folic yeah. acid is synthetic. And yeah. so we don't really want to be like, you know, every cell has, you know, the way that vitamins work, they're cofactors, right? So it's like a, a lock and a key. And the vitamins are the key that unlocks whatever the process is when you're, you know, when your biology is doing what it does. Um, and so if you have kind of like a, a fake key, it blocks up the, the hole in that lock. And so the real vitamin doesn't get in. So it is different. Um, I mean, it all matters. And that's mm -hmm. why I like food first. But, you know, to your same point, th there are plenty of really healthful people with healthy, great habits walking around with with nutritional deficiencies mm -hmm. that they don't know about. So I get really irritated when there's these studies and the news always picks mm -hmm. it up about how like a multivitamin doesn't do anything for you. Ugh. Well, the telomere data says else uh, says something else. It yeah. says that a multivitamin does actually help. Yay. Um, yeah. So what, we, so, so what we need to do in that part, and I think <laughs> this is where, so I got two questions and I just want to make sure I'm, I'm on our, on our time schedule. Um, want to make sure that I ask them, but so that is a key takeaway um, because what you're saying with the telomeres, if, if they're saying that the research, the multivitamins um, are effective. And, and of course, when we use the word multivitamin, we also mean multiminerals. So we want to include yes. on that part because uh, you mentioned some of those. But so that might be just like one thing that somebody could do to be taking care of their telomeres. But I would 
Imagine also, I'm not even going to imagine, I'm going to be prescriptive here. Make sure it's a good multivitamin, multivitamin. Yeah, because good quality. And you just gave an example. So is there anything else between, so the one you just said folic acid versus folate or a methylfolate. So that would be one thing to look at. And um, I, any of the other nutrients that you would you would want to see in that multivitamin in a specific oh, form? Oh, you know what was important is yeah. vitamin D status. D status. D is in dog. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, you know, and it's really important to test your levels every so often mm-hmm. to make sure that you're getting enough because, you know, you can eat all the right foods. You're not going to get enough vitamin D because that's a sunshine vitamin. We make it in our skin, but depending on where you live, you can't make it year round. Yes. And so that has big implications with how well your body is balancing in inflammation and how well your um, immune system functions and all of these kinds of things. So vitamin D was really important. Omega-3 was really important. And it's important to get high quality there too. You want to use a company that is checking for heavy metals because- That is a risk. Like, so you um, would be like hurting your telomeres at the same time you're trying to help them. That, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, if you're exposed yeah. to heavy metals, that is not good for your telomeres. Yeah. That's for sure. So if you can't uh, do, yeah. if you can't consistently do a telomere test, because we, we're, as we're understanding it, it's just not there yet. You may be right. working with a practitioner. But one of the things you can do, I love that you were talking about checking your vitamin D status, because we yeah. even know that even if you do take in a high amount of vitamin D, you actually may not convert it depending on your digestive health and these other pieces. So to know your status, um, I love that. So for telomeres, that's going to be another one. Um, yeah. So with the, um, uh, was there anything else in the research about from it, nutrients, anything that was surprising? Was it like you want to throw in a CoQ10 or you need to look for, you know, a blend of tocotrienols and tocopherols, like anything that was sort of more specific or not, not yet? I think in terms of healthy fat, they really, uh, the they kind of stuck to food, which was pretty cool. So they talked about like avocado and nuts and seeds Mm -hmm. and fatty fish. And I would intersect that and say like small fatty fish. Yes. You want to go for the big guys because they're high in heavy metals. Um, And then there's one herb that was a real standout Mm. called astragalus. Mm-hmm which is actually a really important, it's actually uh, one of the cornerstone herbs in traditional Chinese medicine because it's a qi tonifier. I don't totally know what that means because I'm yeah. not an expert in traditional Chinese <laughs> medicine, but <laughs> yes. I know some of the keywords. Yes. Anyway, um, astragalus is really great. I use it um, every day through cold and flu season just to kind of keep my immune system strong because um, I work at a doctor's office and sick people come in all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it seems that uh, there is some research to support that certain, I think it was like certain strains of astragalus. Mm -hmm. It was hard to tell if that was a general recommendation or not. And it was also hard to tell what the specific dose was. Mm. But astragalus seems to be an important herb in um, maintaining and elongating telomeres. So that was really interesting. But as far as like take home advice, I mean, I think that if you boil it down to eating enough of the right kind of foods, And the right kind of foods being, you know, plant foods, fruits and vegetables, high quality, um, organic, if you can, because they're higher in antioxidants. Mm -hmm. That's really, that's a key issue. And they're low. I mean, pesticides, it's a persistent organic pollutant. It's not Mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know we're not drinking it, but it's not nothing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's microdosing, right? Mm Microdosing of bad stuff. So it can be pretty powerful. Anyway, um, lots of different colors, fruits and vegetables exercise, but do it in a way that you enjoy it. Mm. And then, you know, spending time with friends and family was part of the inter in, intervention that, uh, Dean Ornish studied. Mm-hmm. So that kind of, um, the pleasurable aspect. I was going to say of, friends and family that you enjoy yes, spending time that's with. That's the caveat. Right. Less of the Thanksgiving out. drama and yeah. more of the fun time. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because yeah. if, it, if it's a stressful interaction, yes. then no, it's not that's helpful right. at all. That's right. But, you know, managing stress by whatever means you can. So, like, you know, meditation, if that's what helps, mm. or different kinds of exercise, time spent with the people that you love. Right. Um, being outdoors and being in nature seem to be an important part, too. So, so it's basically boils down to, you know, like loving kindness, because apparently mm-hmm. practicing this kind of loving kind, kindness meditation, which P.S. means that you meditate with the feeling of love for everyone, regardless of anything. And mm. the practitioners who know how to do that have longer telomeres than the rest of us. So love yeah. is the medicine too, yes. which is amazing. Interesting practitioners, for those of you practitioners learn it, listening, 
that's a that's a really important space to be in, uh, you know, just to be thinking about what how do you feel about those pieces? Because some days we can be certainly challenged and more yeah. trying more trying to get the meditation in for ourselves than maybe for yeah okay oh and it's so important for healthcare providers. There was even a study that I came across that was healthcare providers in a hospital setting, and they were looking at symptoms of burnout mm -hmm. and how that affects telomeres. So they found, you know, however many people, it wasn't a very big study, but they had, they had like nurses and other kinds of hospital staff that were, um, caregivers mm -hmm. and they tested their telomere, their telomeres both before and after. Mm -hmm. And the intervention was um, like meditation yeah. and stress relief. And they kind of tracked to see um, if indeed that helped with symptoms of burnout, self-described, yeah. um, and then whether or not there was a biological effect. And it turns out that, yeah, there was. I it was it. a small effect because it was only a few weeks long of a study. I think it was like eight weeks or something. So mm. it wasn't a very long study, but yeah. even those short weeks with meditation just to prevent burnout of healthcare providers providers, it elongated their telomeres. So, mm. I mean, the caretakers, we have to take care of ourselves too, because burnout is yeah. very, very real. And I feel like, um, and that we're going to conclude with the, the, one of the key takeaways for me as I'm hearing that also is, um, if you're a healthcare provider, yes, absolutely hear that and hear that study, but we're all almost all caretakers in some capacity in our life. Yeah. And so I think it really is, it's that old oxygen mask, right? Of like putting it on before you, yeah. Um, yep. Robin, I could, this is, first of all, I'm so glad this worked and, uh, I, this, I could talk about this for so long. So we'll, we'll definitely like maybe in about six or eight months pop back and see, because it seems like the research and the capabilities and understanding this just keeps unfolding. And we love yeah. that you're so on top of the research, but also can provide us with the, the clinical application. So yeah. thank you so much. And thank um, you for having me. That absolutely. So and if you if you stayed with us and you're watching on YouTube and you liked what you saw, give us a thumbs up. Um, if you're here on Facebook, we'd love for you to share this or on YouTube um, with other people. This is a not-for-profit project where we're just trying to bring expert advice uh, and information to as many people as we can. And uh, join me a little bit later. We're going to be talking about CBD. And if you aren't joining me physically later, you can join, you can head over to um, the uh, Better Nutrition Program on YouTube or on Facebook and you'll get those. And so interesting about our eco endocannabinoid system and our yes. telomeres. We're, we're kind of putting the whole puzzle together. So yeah. thank you, you for being a part of it. about that in school? I mean, you know, system? yeah, exactly. When when we yeah. do our course on an island, you know, that we all sit around and, and talk over, it, it will uh, definitely make sure we, we bring those two together. So yeah. Definitely. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> all right. Have a great thank one. You. Thank you. Perfect. Take care. Bye. Bye.